This is the story of General Electric, a story about legendary inventor Thomas Edison, jet engines, and unrivaled power. A story that Facebook and Google might do well to study. So let's go back to the beginning. More than a century ago, in the early 1870s, Thomas Edison began working with his father to build a small lab in rural Menlo Park in New Jersey. It took several years alone and a ton of hard work, but when it finally opened in 1876, it became the world's first research and development facility. A year later, Edison had his first major invention, the phonograph. The first words Edison successfully recorded on the phonograph Apparently, he said, Mary had a little lamb. Word of Edison's phonograph quickly spread across the world, and people flocked to witness the marvel, with many referring to Edison as the Wizard of Menlo Park. But the wizard wasn't finished just yet. The following year in 1878, Edison made another groundbreaking discovery. He created a bamboo filament that would allow a newly invented technology called the light bulb to now last for days instead of minutes. However, around the same time, a rival called the Thompson Houston Company was also emerging. Thompson Houston was beginning to threaten Edison's business, making competitive versions of similar products quickly and well. Competition intensified in early 1890, but after two years, both businesses decided to stand down. Financier JP Morgan, who controlled the bulk of Edison's company, made the decision to fuse the two. And by combining them, he effectively created what we know today as General Electric. In 1896, GE became a founding member of the Dow. And in the following years, GE strengthened its grip on the consumer appliance market. For many employees, it was a golden age. The company made quantum strides with products like Edison light bulbs that lit up millions of homes. It manufactured electric locomotives that fueled America's railroad industry. And it also helped advance medicine with x-ray machines that allowed doctors for the very first time to look inside the human body. Throughout the first half of the 20th century, GE began to win numerous Nobel Prizes. One discovery helped build the world's first full-body MRI machine. Another allowed GE to take the first images of blood vessels ever. GE consistently worked hard to stay ahead of its competition, hiring a number of Nobel Prize-winning scientists over the years to help the company continually innovate. By the 1970s, GE CEO and chairman Reginald Jones began to push the company into international markets. In 1981, GE had a new CEO. Jack Welch. Welch was different. GE began to aggressively hire elite corporate talent and ruthlessly cull underperforming employees. While other conglomerates were seen as sprawling and opaque, GE was seen as a role model able to survive downturn after downturn across various industries. Under Welch's leadership, GE went from roughly $27 billion in revenue to nearly five times of that, reaching $130 billion when Welch left. Fortune magazine dubbed Welch the manager of the century. However, industry watchers were beginning to notice the unusual changes in GE's accounting books. Instead of using generally accepted accounting principles, the company began using techniques that were opaque, frustrating market analysts. Fortunately, the insider frustrations didn't reach the wider market. Under Welch's reign, investors remained oblivious, bullish on the company's prospects, and in 2001, they cheered as the mantle passed to his successor, Jeff Immel. The company was now worth nearly $600 billion, but dark clouds were looming. Four days after new CEO Jeff Immel took over, September 11 happened. The World Trade Center was insured by GE Capital, which hurt their insurance business, and demand for air travel also began to dampen, which hurt their plane leasing business. Soon after, GE started hemorrhaging losses. Everything was going wrong. Immel, pushed to act, began to pursue costly acquisitions. On top of 9-11, Immelt had also bought security companies for undisclosed amounts. He also bought at least nine businesses in the oil and gas industry. He even bought Enron's wind turbine business. But the stock price continued to slide, an infection was spreading, and Immelt seemed oblivious to it all. By the time the financial crisis hit, GE almost died. So why did Immelt continue to acquire companies while the stock price was sliding? 
Immelt and the board were making bets of blind optimism on companies that they believed GE could convert to profits. Under Immelt's reign, GE Capital had become a big profit generator for the company. It was taking bigger risks, notably in commercial real estate. So when the housing market crisis hit, the real estate industry took a colossal blow and the GE Capital segment crumbled, forcing it to take a bailout from Warren Buffett, who gave GE $3 billion to stop the bleeding. And soon thereafter, GE was forced to take another $139 billion loan from the federal government. Now, GE had to cut its own dividend for the first time since the Great Depression. This is important because many GE retirees and shareholders who had long relied on GE's consistent payouts had now lost a stable source of income. By the time Immelt stepped down in August 2017, the organization was an overburdened mess. Costly acquisitions began to weigh on the behemoth, and eventually, GE's stock fell to a third of what it was in 1999. So where is GE now? In its current state, despite being the world's largest manufacturer of jet engines and powering a third of the world's electricity, the stock only trades in the single digits. The company retains its core businesses like aviation, power, and has divested itself of many of its former verticals and products. And while CEO Larry Kulp tries his best to right the giant flailing ship around by selling off parts of the company, market watchers look on with skepticism. To quote Ashwas Damodaran, a finance professor at New York University, GE brought electricity to Americans, appliances to kitchens. It's left its imprint. It's accomplished much of what it set out to accomplish. But GE is going to be the last of the 100-year breed. The companies of this century have no chance of lasting 100 years. Technology is a very harsh taskmaster.